extraordinary work week in Leipzig when he had to prepare a cantata for the upcoming Sunday. On Monday he generally started by picking a text uh, and thinking about how to set the text to music so that it would be a coherent whole. Then he had to prepare the physical materials for the cantata performance. He had a stack of blank paper in front of him and he had an inkwell and a sandbox to dry the ink, a quill and a knife to make erasures and he also needed an instrument, a clavichord, to try out things. Then he started by ruling the blank paper, preparing the score in uh, that way uh, uh, by determining the layout of the cantata. Uh, then he entered his musical thoughts, so he generally started with the chorus uh, and added then the arias and the recits and at the very end he put in the concluding chorale. Then when the score was finished he had to copy out the parts. He generally did this with assistants and uh, then we see uh, as uh, this sample shows the four vocal parts that needed to be uh, copied first because he had to start rehearsing the choir first. Then uh, he copied out the uh, string parts, violins, viola, and then the wind parts, two oboes, two horns, and finally the uh, basso continuo. Rehearsals started on Friday, and on Saturday he would, for the first time, hear the work as a whole, but there was generally time only for one quick dress rehearsal and uh, the cantata then had to be performed on Sunday morning at 8 o'clock. What a work week! By 1725, Bach had written, rehearsed and performed two complete cycles of cantatas. A third followed by 1727 and a fourth by 1729, making 240 substantial pieces of music in six years, as well as two Magnificats, a Christmas Oratorio, a series of organ chorale preludes, and a notebook of keyboard compositions for Anna Magdalena, with whom he was to have 13 children. But his tenure at Leipzig was not always happy. He argued about his salary, about the lack of extra fees, one winter it was so mild, he complained, that not enough people had died, with the result that his income from funeral music had been reduced. And about the overall standards of musicianship, he complained that the number of singers I have at my disposal are as follows, 17 usable, 20 not yet usable, and 17 useless. In the Leipzig period, there were a number of confrontations he had, almost according to some master plan, he has his controversies and his uh, confrontations first with the authorities of the university with which he is connected to some extent. Then after he loses that battle, he takes up a battle with the church authorities. And that one we don't quite know how it uh, turned out. And then he turns on the school authorities with whom he has uh, dealings. So it seems that he is constantly framing the nature of his own uh, position within these different organizations, what is his due, what are his prerogatives, and fights for them until ultimately, uh, actually not even ultimately, but soon in the game, he brings his appeal to the highest authority, perhaps the, the king of Poland and Saxony. I think it's remarkable that in a little altercation he has with the university authorities about whether he should get a certain salary for a very minor job, he immediately runs to the king of Saxony with his problem. They must have thought the man was insane. You could say that he had delusions of grandeur as to how important his job really was in the larger scheme of things. Despite Bach's dissatisfaction with the quality of available musicians, his creative ambition remained. In 1727, he gathered together the choirs of the churches and musicians from all over Leipzig to perform his extraordinary masterpiece, The Passion According to St. Matthew, a narrated drama involving recitative, dialogue, meditation, dramatic incident, arias, and chorales unprecedented in Western religious music. 
What sets Bach off from all his contemporaries and makes him, in fact, almost unique in the history of music was his ability to integrate the most dissonant, expressive harmonies into a very basic, consonant background so that we have this combination of stability and very extraordinary expressivity in Bach. And I can give an example from uh, of two pieces, uh, one by Handel and one by Bach, both of them the final pieces of a very great vo uh, liturgical work, the end of the Matthew Passion and the end of Handel's Theodora. Both of them are sarabands, stately dances in 3-4 time, and they're very similar in mood and entirely different in technique. The Handel is very extraordinarily simple and very, at the same time very dramatic. sudden movement of the end out of the range of everything we've heard before the Bach is very similar in rhythm but the richness of sound is much greater Bach has this extraordinarily expressive sound when we get to harmony. <laughs> These very dissonant harmonies, whereas Handel's harmonies are much simpler. It's this enormous richness, and above all, it's the richness of the inner part writing in Bach. It's not the soprano or the bass part. It's the other voices, the alto and the tenor, and so on, which are so extraordinary in Bach. There's a, a sort of no parallel to it in the history of music, but it was an enormous model. The composers who tried to follow him like that, Mozart and, of course, Chopin and others, who, there, there was an, an enormous influence from the rest, rest of the history of Western music up until the 20th century. Yeah. 